All right, so this will be some review questions covering uh, what we talked about in the nephrology slides. This isn't a comprehensive review of nephrology. Uh, this is just some questions covering some of the important points. So uh, a 62-year-old man presents with uh, a history of type 2 diabetes mellitus, and he presents to the ED complaining of progressive weakness over the past day. He's on insulin and takes ibuprofen for joint pain. On physical exam, his blood pressure is 135 over 85 and is only remarkable for generalized muscle tenderness. CBC is unremarkable. On CMP, he has a BUN of 30. I put the normal values here. They may vary somewhat from what the USMLE gives you, but they're approximately the same. USMLE will give you the normal values. Uh, BUN is 30, creatinine is 6. Sodium 142, potassium 6.2, calcium 6.1, phosphate 7.6, and CPK of 32,000. Okay, so which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? A, post-renal failure due to urethral obstruction. B, NSAID-induced acute renal failure. C, rhabdomyolysis. D, NSAID-induced allergic nephritis. Or E, diabetic nephropathy. I'll give you some time to pause here or to go back if you want and look at those values. And the answer is C, rhabdomyolysis. Okay, so this one, uh, I purposefully made this a little bit confusing. And the reason is because a lot of people see an NSAID uh, or they'll see ibuprofen uh, and they'll think, oh, boom, NSAID. This is NSAID acute renal failure, NSAID allergic nephritis. That's what's causing the kidney failure in this patient. You can't just look at NSAIDs and renal failure and think this must be NSAID induced renal failure. NSAIDs can cause rhabdomyolysis as well, and that can cause renal failure. Look at this generalized muscle tenderness. That's not something you would get in NSAID-induced renal failure. Uh, another thing is that, look at these labs. Look at that creatinine. It's 6 milligrams per deciliter. This is very, very, very high compared to the BUN. You would not expect to see a creatinine of 6 milligrams per deciliter in a patient with a BUN of only 30. You would more expect to see a, a creatinine of 6 in a patient with a BUN of like 70 or 80. So something that points to rhabdomyolysis is a creatinine that's uh, that's disproportionately elevated compared to the BUN. So a BUN creatinine ratio that's low. And the reason is because BUN comes from renal failure, but creatinine comes from renal failure and muscle breakdown. Muscle breakdown is what rhabdomyolysis essentially is. So a creatinine that's six would be very, very indicative for for rhabdomyolysis if the BUN is only 30. So creatinine comes from, uh, it can be elevated from renal failure, yes, but it's also uh, can be elevated due to muscle breakdown. And so in this case, it's disproportionately high. We have a low BUN creatinine ratio as a consequence from that. And then another thing uh, is that the CPK does not have to be high in order to diagnose rhabdomyolysis. So yes, this patient will ultimately have a high CPK, but early on in the course of rhabdomyolysis, the CPK is not necessarily going to be high. So if you have a patient that has renal failure and a, a very high CPK, then that points towards rhabdomyolysis. But just because the CPK is normal does not mean the patient, it doesn't it doesn't outrule rhabdomyolysis. It doesn't mean the patient can't have rhabdomyolysis. And then of course this potassium this potassium is what's causing the weakness. Uh, so it's very high. Uh, and that's due to the rhabdomyolysis. So you're having potassium spilling out of the muscle cells that are being destroyed and the renal failure as well. So this kind of just covers what I talked about. Generalized muscle tenderness and the, uh, the low creatinine, or the high creatinine, disproportionately high creatinine, the low BUN creatinine ratio is uh, what should point you towards this diagnosis. And remember, ibuprofen and NSAIDs can cause uh, uh, rhabdomyolysis. And what's another class of drugs that commonly cause rhabdomyolysis? 
would be the statins. So pravastatin, atorvastatin, lovastatin, and so forth. The HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors to reduce your cholesterol. All right. So which of the, this is the same patient. So assuming we've diagnosed, or even if we haven't diagnosed uh, rhabdo in this patient, you have your potassium of, of 6.2. Which of the following is the, mo the most appropriate next step in the treatment of this patient? Is it A, hemodialysis, B, EKG, C, K-exalate, D, urinalysis, or E, consult nephrology? I'll give you time to pause. The answer is B, EKG. So, um, Oh, I changed those. Either way, it's not the right answer. Okay, so um, okay, so why is it EKG? Anytime you have a patient with a high potassium, if it's if you have an elevated potassium, particular well, anytime. Let me just tell you this: anytime you have a patient with an elevated potassium, always, 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 your next step, assuming that they don't have any problems with their airway, their breathing, and their circulation. Assuming that you don't have any ABC problems that you have to worry about, your next step in a patient with a high potassium is an EKG. Because having a high potassium can, I mean, let's, let's remember this. Injecting somebody with potassium is what they do to death row criminals when, when they execute them. So having a high potassium is not good. We want, to, we want to make sure that the heart is functioning properly. We have to check uh, the QRS uh, waves. We have to check our T waves. We, we need to make sure that this patient isn't having uh, electrical abnormalities in their conduction system. So always, 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 EKG is the next step after we see a high potassium. Then we can start treating the rhabdomyolysis. So the indications for dialysis in any patient with renal disease, uh, one would be metabolic acidosis. So these are A-E-I-O-U, so this is how you remember it. A for acidosis, metabolic acidosis. E for electrolyte abnormalities with EKG changes. So like what we might see in this patient. Uh, that's why we're getting the EKG. I for the slime intoxications, so salicylates, methanol, and so forth. Uh, o for overload of fluids not responsive to diuretics, and then U for uremic symptoms, so pericardial rub, encephalitis, ne uh, neuropathy, uh, GI bleeds, etc. Okay, so this is the same patient. So now the question is, which of the following is the best diagnostic test in this patient? So when the USMLE tells you which of the following is the best diagnostic test, what they're asking, what they want to know is that one, you know what, your, what the presumptive diagnosis is, and then two, what the answer is then is going to be what is the best test to make that diagnosis. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Well, we just had that question. That's rhabdomyolysis. So when the USMLE asks you this question, which of the following is the best diagnostic test in this patient? What they're asking you to do is make two steps. One, they assume that you know what the presumptive diagnosis is, rhabdomyolysis. Now they're asking you which of the following is the best diagnostic test to diagnose that presumptive diagnosis. So A, renal ultrasound, B, EKG, C, pelvic CT, D, urinalysis, or E, urine-uric acid to urine-creatinine ratio. And the answer is D, urinalysis. So urinalysis is the best test to confirm rhabdomyolysis, and the reason is because uh, we would expect to see uh, red blood cells positive on uh, urinalysis. That would be, uh, if we don't have a high CPK, um, which we wouldn't early on in, the, uh, in this patient, um, we would expect to see red blood cells positive in rhabdomyolysis. If we don't see positive red blood cells, if we don't see a positive myoglobin in uh, this patient, then we can outrule 
rhabdomyolysis because rhabdo patients are always going to have a positive quote unquote red blood cell in their uh, in their urine and it's not actually red blood cells it's myoglobin so when you have a patient you suspect rhabdo get a urinalysis if it comes back with positive red blood cells know that they're not red blood cells they're myoglobin so red blood cells kind of doubles as red blood cells and myoglobin. The urinalysis can't tell the difference between hemoglobin and myoglobin. Uh, so renal ultrasound is good for uh, diagnosing uh, backup for stones and for hydronephrosis. Electrocardiogram is good, which we just did, to diagnose complications of high potassium. Uh, pelvic CT is, uh, well, it's not nothing, uh, but it's it's nothing related to anything this patient could have. It would be good for, uh, for finding stones. And then urine, uric acid, urine creatinine ratio would be good to, uh, if you were thinking acute urate nephritis. This patient does have a high uric acid, but uh, this patient has rhabdomyolysis. There's much more signs that make that much more likely. And just to review, uh, this patient has elevated T waves, which would be, um, well, not necessarily this patient, but uh, a patient with a high potassium can have elevated T waves. That would be the, the EKG abnormality that we would look for, uh, that we would then start that patient on dialysis, because that would be an EKG uh, complication of an electrolyte abnormality. So the E indication um, back in our AEIOU, the E indication for dialysis. So here's our T waves. They're elevated here, 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 and here, really all over the place. So in your limb leads, if it's more than half of a, of a big box, then uh, that's elevated. And in your precordial leads, if it's uh, more than one big box, so this is two, this is like four, so obviously, yeah, I mean, these, these, these T waves are so high, they're, they almost look like QRS complexes. So pretty significant on this reading. Okay, so patient's EKG is shown. Which of the following is the best next step? So I kind of just answered this for you. A, hemodialysis. B, IV sodium bicarb, followed by hemodialysis. C, caexalate. D, IV calcium gluconate, followed by hemodialysis. Or E, caexalate and hemodialysis. Okay, so this might not be as obvious as I made it. All right, so I'll give you some time to pause it. What do you do for a patient with a high potassium and EKG changes? Before you give them hemodialysis, you are going to start IV calcium gluconate. And um, you'll give them that calcium gluconate while you're wheeling them down for hemodialysis. But what I want you to know is that the next step after getting an abnormal EKG with a, with a high potassium is to give that patient calcium gluconate. That's going to stabilize the heart and it, it will get rid of those EKG changes. You're going to be bringing this patient down for hemodialysis anyway because you need to get that potassium down. But uh, you got to give that, them that calcium gluconate first and the USMLE is going to want you to know that calcium gluconate is very important to give a patient that has high potassium with EKG changes. So yes, we do the hemodialysis but the reason that hemodialysis is not the right answer here is because we have to not only give them hemodialysis, but we have to give them calcium gluconate. k wouldn't be the appropriate answer here because k simply absorbs potassium from the GI tract. It doesn't uh, stabilize the heart. Question 5 gives us an 88-year-old woman found unresponsive in her home by her daughter after not having heard from her in two days. She's brought in by EMS. Her blood pressure is 85 over 60. She was given one bolus of normal saline en route. A Foley catheter has been placed, and she's gotten CMP, urinalysis, and ABGs drawn. Okay, and then here's a list of uh, pertinent lab results. BUN is 24 milligrams per deciliter, creatinine 0.8, 
sodium 141, potassium 2.8, uh, chloride 118, bicarb 14, urine pH is 4.5, and then partial pressure of oxygen is 85, carbon dioxide 23, and blood pH is 7.27. So you can pause it here if you want to write these down. You can always come back. So the question is, which of the following is the metabolic disturbance in this patient? Is it A, metabolic acidosis? B, metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis, C, anion gap metabolic acidosis, D, respiratory acidosis, or E, respiratory acidosis with metabolic alkalosis. We'll go back here so you can look at these lab results. All right, go ahead and pause if you're not ready yet. And the answer here is B, metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis. So we know that this patient has some kind of acidosis because her blood pH is, what was it, 7.27. So that's certainly uh, in the range of metabolic or of acidosis in general. So from that, uh, you can, well, actually you can't get rid of any of these. Uh, but we do know that her bicarb is, where is it? Her bicarb is low, so we know that this is some kind of metabolic acidosis. So from that, we can get rid of uh, E. Uh, we also, I put the anion gap here, so I kind of I gave you that, but you should know how to compute anion gap. Uh, so the anion gap here was nine, and the anion gap must be over 11 in order for you to have an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that's out. Uh, we also know it's, so D and E are out too because we know that this is metabolic acidosis. So uh, we're left with A and B, metabolic acidosis and metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis. In order to determine whether or not you have a respiratory compensation, whether that respiratory compensation is appropriate or if it's a respiratory alkalosis, you need something called Winter's Formula. Winter's formula evaluates respiratory compensation when you have a metabolic acidosis present. So if you have a metabolic acidosis, you should plug in your numbers into Winter's formula to determine whether the patient has an appropriate response, uh, an adequate response uh, respiratory-wise to the metabolic acidosis, or if it's uh, insufficient. So let's look at the formula. So our expected PCO2 is going to be equal to 1.5 times the bicarb level plus 8 plus or minus 2. So plug in our numbers here. Bicarb was 14 milliequivalents per liter. The PCO2 is 23 uh, millimeters of mercury. So plugging in 14, we get 1.5 times 14 plus 8 plus or minus 2. That comes out to 21 plus 8 plus or minus 2 or 29 plus or minus 2. So our range is 27 to 31. So if it falls within that range, then you have an adequate respiratory compensation. Okay, so PCO2 corresponds to the calculated range. Respiratory compensation is adequate. If the PCO2 is lower than the calculated range, then the patient has a respiratory alkalosis. So in other words, they're getting rid of more uh, CO2 than we would expect them to. And that's the case in this patient. So her PCO2 is even lower than what we would expect. So she also has a respiratory alkalosis in addition to her metabolic acidosis. Uh, then if the PCO2 is higher than the calculated range, then the patient does not have an adequate respiratory compensation and they'll actually, they actually also have a respiratory acidosis then. So remember Winter's formula. Pretty easy to remember. It's just one and a half times the bicarb plus eight plus or minus two. Okay, so uh, we're still on the same patient. So this patient uh, we have diagnosed with metabolic acidosis. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's metabolic disturbance? So is it proximal renal tubular acidosis? GI loss due to diarrhea, GI loss due to vomiting, 
aspirin overdose or carbon monoxide poisoning. So we, they have a metabolic acidosis. And remember what their anion gap was? It was like 9 or 10. What's the normal anion gap? Pause it if you don't want to hear it. Normal anion gap is 11. So is this an anion gap metabolic acidosis? No. So this, the answer is going to be B, GI loss due to diarrhea. So proximal renal tubular acidosis would be a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that is potential, theoretically. But renal tubular acidosis is a chronic thing. So this wouldn't be in a patient that's all, all of a sudden unresponsive. That's, that would be very unlikely. So it's possible, but it's not the most likely. GI loss due to diarrhea is much more likely. GI loss due to vomiting would cause a metabolic alkalosis. Remember, you're losing acid from, from your uh, GI tract, so you're, you're going to have a high bicarb. Aspirin overdose would be an anion gap metabolic acidosis. You have a salicylate poisoning. And then carbon monoxide poisoning would also cause an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So know your causes of anion gap metabolic acidosis. That's your mud piles. So if you don't remember that, go back to the metabolic acidosis slides. Okay, 62-year-old man with a history of alcoholism and poorly controlled type 1 diabetes presents to the clinic complaining of recent onset of numbness and tingling in his hands and feet. Physical reveals bilateral decreased vibratory and pinprick sensation in the distal extremities. CBC and CMP show a sodium of 138, a potassium of 5, a BUN of 100, a creatinine that's sky high of 7.7, .7, hemoglobin of 12, a hematocrit of 36, an MCV of 85, a white count of 10.2, platelets of 280, and a hemoglobin A1C that's high at 8.2. All right, so which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? Is it A, hemodialysis, B, vitamin B12 infusion, C, urinalysis, D, a serial nerve biopsy, or is it E, administration of recombinant erythropoietin? So I'll let you take a look at these again. So this patient is anemic with a normal... MCV, so it's a normal acidic anemia. The BUN and creatinine are high. And they got that nasty A1C count. I didn't put in a glucose, so let's just say it was high too. Okay, so here's their answer choices. Might want to pause it here. And the answer is A, hemodialysis. So remember what our indications were for dialysis, and the U was uremic symptoms. And one of the uremic symptoms is neuropathy. And this is neuropathy right here. Decreased vibratory and pinprick sensation. Numbness and tingling. That's neuropathy. So no matter what, this patient hemodialysis is going to be the next step. Now let's say he didn't have the the neuropathy and we didn't have to do dialysis would we need a vitamin b12 infusion well let's take a look he is an alcoholic so he is at risk of vitamin b12 deficiency and he is anemic but his mcv what would we expect in a patient with a uh, an anemia who's an alcoholic who has anemia due to his alcoholism you have to think of your hematology here. We would imagine that the MCV would be high. He would have a macrocytic anemia. So he does not need B12. He's not B12 deficient. Urinalysis would be unnecessary in this patient. A sural nerve biopsy is something totally different. That's to diagnose polyarteritis nodosa. And uh, administration of recombinant erythropoietin, that's probably the cause of this patient's anemia is a chronic kidney disease. Uh, in which case you would develop erythropoietin, 
but his anemia is not significant. He does not have symptoms of anemia. Numbness and tingling is not symptoms of anemia. If he came in with pallor and fatigue, uh, and his uh, and, and he didn't have the neuropathy, then sure, then you could administer erythropoietin or start iron. Uh, but uh, but this patient has neuropathy, so uh, a lot because he's got that awful creatinine, uh, and he's got uh, diabetes mellitus. He's going to need dialysis to get that creatinine down in order to uh, to get rid of the neuropathy. So remember your your indications for neuropathy because the USMLE likes to talk about that. And this patient has diabetic nephropathy. Okay, so a 44 year old woman presents to your clinic for a follow up on high blood pressure. Her blood pressure is 142 over 95 today. Last month it was 147 over 94, and two months ago it was 143 over 90. Her family history is significant for hypertension, and her personal history is significant for type 2 diabetes mellitus, which was diagnosed two years ago, which she has controlled well with diet and exercise. Her most recent hemoglobin A1c was 5.7. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? A. Atenolol, B. Verapamil, C. Lisinopril, D. Furosemide, or E. Sodium Restriction Diet? Okay, uh, so this patient has had three consecutive high blood pressure readings, and so she is now going to be started on therapy, and the first therapy we're going to give her, since it just says woman, is lisinopril. So an ACE inhibitor is always our first step. Okay, actually, let me backtrack. Um, ACE inhibitor is not necessarily our first step. We could start her on a diuretic. Um, so we could start her on hydrochlorothiazide, but because she has diabetes, we want to start her on an ACE inhibitor because it's renally protective. So an ACE inhibitor is the better drug to give a patient with high blood pressure if they have concurrent diabetes. Uh, either way, you wouldn't give her furosemide. You would give her hydrochlorothiazide if you're going to start her on a diuretic. So if she didn't have diabetes, then the best answer would have been hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, so lisinopril in her because she's got blood, high blood pressure and diabetes. So we give her lisinopril. All right, uh, tenolol is a beta blocker. That would be an add-on therapy if, if this were to uh, progress. Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker. That could also be an add-on therapy, but you would never start a tenolol or verapamil uh, as monotherapy. You would, you would give that with the lisinopril. Uh, you can use a, uh, a tenolol or verapamil for monotherapy, but it wouldn't be for high blood pressure. And then furosemide is a diuretic and sodium restriction diet. That would be something that you would have told her before when she had that first high blood pressure reading. You'd say, well, keep your sodium in check. But since she's had three consecutive readings, uh, we have to treat her medically. Okay, same patient, but now she's black. What are we going to do for her now? We got the same answer choices, essentially. Atenolol, captopril, lisinopril, valsartan, or a sodium restriction diet. And you should probably know this one because it's valsartan. And why do we give her valsartan instead of lisinopril? And you probably know that it's the reason I have underlined here. African-American patients do not do as well on ACE inhibitors. So any black patient where we would normally, if they weren't black, where we would normally give them ACE inhibitors, any patient where we would give them ACE inhibitors, if they're black, we give them angiotensin receptor blockers. That's just a rule of thumb. So black patients do much better on angiotensin receptor blockers. It's This has been proven with population studies. So we give black patients uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. Who else do we give angiotensin receptor blockers? We give that to any patient that we give ACE inhibitors that can't tolerate it because they get angioedema, because they get uh, a chronic cough that's 
intolerable, uh, which is a side effect of ACE inhibitors. So uh, Valsartan is the first drug of choice in black patients with hypertension and diabetes, and it's uh, the replacement drug in anybody else that's got side effects. Okay, so three months later, the patient in the previous two questions returns to your clinic. Despite having started either lisinopril or valsartan, depending on the patient, her blood pressure is still elevated at 142 over 95. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? Is it A, furosemide, B, verapamil, C, hydrochlorothiazide, D, order an electrocardiogram, or sorry, D, order an echocardiogram, or E, order an electrocardiogram. And I will let you pause this. The answer is hydrochlorothiazide. So uh, hydrochlorothiazide would have been the first drug we would have went to if this patient didn't have diabetes. Um, but since she had diabetes, we went to the uh, the. Uh, ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker, depending on her race. Uh, but uh, now that the uh, ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker hasn't been uh, effective in monotherapy, we're going to add on hydrochlorothiazide. So we add on uh, the thiazide diuretic when the ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is not doing, uh, is not doing it on its own. Now, if the patient only had high blood pressure, if this was the patient, a patient with high blood pressure and no diabetes, hydrochlorothiazide would have been the first drug we would have went to. All right, a 25-year-old man presents to your urgent care clinic having had a two-month history of blood-tinged sputum and shortness of breath. This afternoon at work, he noticed blood in his urine. Besides having had asthma since he was four years old, his history is unremarkable. On physical exam, his temperature is 99.9. .9. Respiratory rate is 21 per minute. There is a mild pitting edema in his lower extremities. And on auscultation, you hear bilateral basal crackles. CBC and CMP is normal, and I am going to say, I didn't put this on there, but um, on a uh, sputum exam, you note hemosiderin-laden macrophages. Your analysis shows 3 plus red blood cells, 3 plus protein, and your ANCAs are negative. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Is it A, Wegener's granulomatosis, B, Churg-Strauss syndrome, C, polyarteritis nodosa, D, post-infectious glomerulonephritis, or E, good pasture syndrome? And the answer is E, good pasture syndrome. So uh, how do we eliminate these other ones? Well, first off, and I gave you the asthma there to, to, to try to trick you up, uh, USMLE might do that. Uh, so Wegener's and Churg-Strauss are, are ANCA-related syndrome, so they would have positive ANCAs. Churg-Strauss would be the patient that have, has asthma. So this could just as easily be a Wegener's or Churg-Strauss patient, but they would have to have positive ANCA. Polyarteritis nodosa is not likely because those patients tend to have uh, they tend to be drug users, they tend to have hepatitis, they tend to have abdominal pain uh, on presentation. So that's less likely. Post-infectious glomerulonephritis, uh, and also polyarteritis nodosa is not going to have respiratory symptoms. And post-infectious glomerulonephritis is not likely because they also will not have respiratory symptoms. They'll simply have the, uh, the blood cells in their urine. So the answer is good pasture syndrome, and uh, what good pasture syndrome is uh, is, is simply a uh, antibody that attacks glomerular basement membrane, uh, and that basement membrane is prominent both in the lungs and in the uh, in in the kidneys. So you're going to get destruction of your uh, lung tissue and destruction of your glomerulus. And so that's what's causing the blood-tinged sputum and the hematuria. 
So same patient, which of the following is the best medical management for this patient? Is it A, cyclophosphamide and steroids, B, plasmapheresis and steroids, C, hemodialysis and steroids, D, furosemide and steroids, or E, captopril and steroids? And the answer is B, plasmapheresis and steroids. So um, we're going to give this patient plasmapheresis because we can actually get those anti-GBM uh, uh, antibodies out of his blood. So that, that's actually effective in, in good pastures. And that's, that's a good thing because uh, we can't do that in Wegener's or Church Strauss. So plasmapheresis is going to be uh, how we treat patients with good pasture syndrome. The steroids are useful too because that reduces any existing inflammation, but the plasmapheresis is good because it takes the anti-GVM uh, antibodies out. We can't do that in Wegener's or Churg Strauss, so we give them cyclophosphamide and steroids. We can also give cyclophosphamide to uh, good pastures patients, but uh, plasmapheresis is going to be our treatment of choice. Hemodialysis and steroids, there's no indications for that. Uh, furosemide, furosemide and steroids, never. I just made these things up. Uh, mycophenolate and steroids, uh, that's for patients with lupus nephritis. So mycophenolate is better than cyclophosphamide in patients with lupus nephritis. And this we talked about in the uh, glomerular nephritis section. Okay, a 40-year-old black man with a history of heroin use presents to your clinic complaining of swelling in his fingers. Blood pressure is 160 over 105. Physical exam is notable for edema as well as track marks on his right arm. When you look at his file, you see that he has had multiple admissions for pneumonia. Renal function tests show a creatinine of 2.0 and a BUN of 30. Urinalysis shows 4 plus protein and 2 plus red blood cells and waxy casts. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? A. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. B. Membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. C. Lupus nephritis. D. Membranous glomerulonephritis. E, minimal change disease. And the answer is A. So focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis are both uh, in the category of the rapidly proliferative, rapidly proliferative glomerulonephritides. So what those are are basically uh, glomerulonephritides that, uh, that come on and they happen fast and uh, they cause nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so you're going to be able to get rid of C, D, and E because membranous glomerulonephritis is ge generally secondary to infections or cancer. Uh, lupus nephritis, these patients are going to have to have symptoms of lupus. He doesn't. Minimal change disease tends to happen in children. So focal segmental or membranoproliferative are your, uh, are your um, choices. And what you should know is that focal segmental is more common in blacks and membranoproliferative is more common in whites. Focal segmental is more common in HIV patients. Membranoproliferative is more common in hepatitis patients. Membranoproliferative is also more common in young patients, and it can also be idiopathic. Also, with focal segmental, you're going to have waxy casts. So I kind of put all of these in this question, in that he's black and he has waxy casts. Remember that... Uh, IV drug use is a huge risk factor for HIV, and this patient has had multiple admissions for pneumonia, so he may be immunocompromised, um, so you might want to get a, uh, an HIV test on this patient. Um, so remember your risk factors for the RPGNs, so focal segmental is black, HIV, and waxy casts. 
and membranoproliferative would be white, hepatitis, young, and idiopathic. A 19-year-old woman presents to the ED with weakness. Physical exam is totally normal. You remember this patient as she's been in at least three times over the past year with diagnosed nephrolithiasis. Her CMP shows a sodium of 140, a chloride of 113, a potassium of 3.2, and a bicarb of 19. You decide to get uh, arterial blood gases, which show a blood pH of 7.33 and a PCO2 of 20. Which of the following is the most likely metabolic disturbance in this patient? Okay, the answer is A, metabolic acidosis. So notice that her bicarb is low. Uh, her PCO2 is low, so she is compensating. That's why her blood pH isn't totally on the floor. Uh, it's not a mixed metabolic and resp uh, respiratory acidosis because her PCO2 would be high in that case if she had a respiratory acidosis, and that's not a respiratory acidosis, so that gets rid of C and D. Her anion gap is 8, uh, if you do the math, so that gets rid of anion gap metabolic acidosis. And it's not metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis because in that case she would have a normal pH. So, and in that case she would also have a uh, severely low PCO2. So uh, metabolic acidosis is most likely uh, diagnosis in this patient. All right, so which of the following is the most likely uh, diagnosis? So we know what the metabolic disturbance diagnosis is. It's metabolic acidosis. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? So on urinalysis, you have a urine pH of 6.0. So what kind of urine pH would you expect in a patient with acidosis? All right, so I'll give you some time to think about that. You can pause it here. And the answer is type 1 RTA. So this patient has a uh, type 1 RTA. And remember your, your RTAs. So type 1 RTA is going to be your distal uh, renal tubular acid, acidosis. So people with type 1 RTA, with a distal RTA, they can't, they have they have acidemia, they have acidosis, and they can't acidify their urine. Um, or I'm sorry, they can't, uh, they can't alkalize their urine. So um, these patients, they have a uh, ineffective hydrogen potassium pump. So because they can't acidify their urine, they're going to have a, uh, a high urinary pH. So they're gonna have a acidosis so a, uh, a low blood pH, but they're going to have a high urinary pH because they can't pump the, that hydrogen into their urine. So their urinary pH is going to be uh, abnormally high. So it would be greater than 5.4. So this patient, you have a urine pH of 6.0. That's above the magic number of 5.4 in renal tubular acidosis. She's got a low potassium, and she's got a, an acidosis. So you're always going to see acidosis in patients with renal tubular acidosis. So remember that. Uh, the only thing that's going to be, uh, the only thing that's going to be different, uh, besides the fact that, uh, okay, so let me rephrase this here. Uh, all patients with renal tubular acidosis are going to have a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So once you know that they have a non-ion gap metabolic acidosis, then you can start figuring out if they have a renal tubular acidosis. So uh, the way you're going to think of this is based on urinary pH and potassium. So type 1, they're going to have a high urinary pH because they can't acidify their urine. Type 2, they'll have a low urinary pH because they have the acidosis and they can acidify their urine. 
So type 2 is the proximal renal tubular acidosis, and that's due to the bicarb channel. Type 4 is just simply uh, an abnormality of the channels that are responsive to aldosterone. So these patients will have, unlike type 1 and type 2 where they have a hypokalemia, type 4 RTA patients will have a hyperkalemia and a hyponatremia. So that, that's why we don't have type 4 here because this patient has a low potassium, um, not a high potassium. Uh, the other two are both hyperkalemia, Addison's disease, and Kahn syndrome. Uh, or sorry, Addison's disease is hyperkalemia, Kahn syndrome is hypernatremia. So it's not, hype, it's not Addison's disease because she doesn't have a hyperkalemia, and it's not Kahn syndrome because she doesn't have a hypernatremia. Remember what Addison's disease is, it's a destruction of the adrenal glands leading to low aldosterone and other symptoms, so you'd have a hyperkalemia, a hyponatremia. Kahn syndrome is a, uh, is a tumor on the adrenals secreting aldosterone, so you'd have a high aldosterone state, so you'd have a high sodium and uh, other symptoms like edema. Uh, these patients will not have acidosis. Uh, so uh, really the renal tubular acidoses were your only possible choices. And this is that diagram that I made for you that I uh, showed you in the other section. Uh, so type 2 RTA is proximal. Uh, the problem with these patients is that they can't reabsorb bicarb. Uh, type 1 is what this patient has. The problem is, is that they can't pump out hydrogen and so their urine is going to be alkalotic. It's going to be greater than 5.4. And the type 4 is just they have problems with the aldosterone-mediated channels. So they'll have, a problem, uh, they'll have a problem excreting potassium. So they'll have hyperkalemia, unlike the other RTAs. All right, so same patient. Which of the following is the best medical management? A, oral bicarb and oral potassium replacement. B, oral bicarb, oral potassium replacement, and furosemide. C, fludrocortisone, D, IV bicarb, IV potassium chloride at 10 milliequivalents per hour, E, IV potassium chloride at 10 milliequivalents per hour. And the answer is A. So oral bicarb and oral potassium replacement is what we do for patients with uh, type 1 or distal um, RTA. So we already established that this patient has type 1 RTA, so it's just going to be oral bicarb and oral potassium. With patients with uh, type 2, we give them the same thing, oral bicarb and oral potassium, and we add on furosemide. Uh, so this patient doesn't have type 2 because her, her uh, urinary pH is high, not normal or low. So... Uh, we don't give her furosemide. Fludrocortisone is for patients with type 4 RTA. That's the aldosterone channel RTA. Uh, we don't need to give her IV therapy. She's not vomiting. She's not uh, in dire need of, of IV therapy. So here is uh, how you differentiate your RTAs. You're really looking just at serum potassium and urine pH. And another thing is you can look at the symptoms. So patients with a history of type 1 RTA, they're going to have a history of chronic nephrolithiasis. Why? Because they can't acidify their urine. Their urine is high, or their urine pH is high. So because their urine pH is high, it puts them at risk for developing kidney stones. Type 2, they're going to have osteomalacia and rickets uh, as a history. Type 4, because they have a low sodium, they're going to have a salt craving. They're going to have a low blood pressure because they have volume depletion. And these patients also uh, are uh, at risk for uh, having a history of diabetes mellitus. All right, so I believe this is, uh, I think we got two left. So a 35-year-old woman presents to the ED with constant flank pain. She rates this as a 10 out of 10 and says it's worse than childbirth. 
Physical exam reveals a patient in significant distress with a blood pressure of 142 over 95. Urinalysis shows microhematuria. CMP is unremarkable. Which of the following is the next best step in the management of this patient? A, abdominal or pelvic CT. B, renal ultrasound. C, abdominal plain film. D, IV catorolac. Or E, acetaminophen. And the answer is... D, IV catorolac. So you might have been looking at this and thinking, we got to find that kidney stone and we got to know how big it is. And yes, you do, but this patient is also in pain and we need to treat the pain first. Uh, the kidney stone is not going to kill her, um, but the pain she thinks is killing her. So we have to give her her pain meds. We can give her NSAIDs. We can give her... Uh, we can give her uh, opioids, we can give her morphine, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, as long as she's not pregnant, if she's pregnant, then we can only give her acetaminophen. Since it doesn't indicate on this that she's pregnant, then you can assume that she's not pregnant. If it says she's pregnant, uh, then you need to give her acetaminophen. All right, and the last question, uh, so, same patient, which of the following is the most accurate diagnostic test for this patient? And you probably know the answer to this question. In any patient where we suspect a kidney stone, we are going to give them, get them a CT. And the reason is because this is the most accurate diagnostic test. However, if the CT is negative, then we will do a renal ultrasound, especially if we have an acidic urine. Because remember, uric acid stones are radiolucent, so we will not see them on CT. So if she has a, an acidic urine, which we will want to get a urinalysis, we had a urinalysis here, we didn't see acidic urine because it didn't tell us. If USMLE doesn't tell us a finding, then we can assume it's normal. Um, so... She didn't have acidic urine, so we, uh, anyway, we're going to get an abdominal CT first, but if she had acidic urine and we got a CT and it came back negative, we probably want to get a renal ultrasound to see if we have uric acid stones because they can accumulate in acidic urine. Um, so abdominal or pelvic CT would be our first step no matter what. Abdominal plain film is okay. That could show a kidney stone, but it's not the most accurate test. MRI, never. Uh, if you've ever been in an MRI machine, um, it's really excruciating to have to lay in there, and you can imagine how much worse it would be if you had excruciating flank pain. So um, and besides, we never use MRI for kidney stones anyway. It's way too expensive, and it's useless for, for kidney stones. And then intravenous pyelography uh, used to be used a long time ago, uh, but uh, we don't use that. It's, it's also not the most accurate. So CT for kidney stones. Remember, if it's greater than, uh, if it's less than five millimeters, we'll let her pass it on her own. If it's greater than seven millimeters, she's definitely going to need surgical uh, therapy. So she's going to need uh, lithotripsy or open surgery. Uh, if, she, if she's pregnant, then um, we'll have to, uh, we'll, we'd have to do open surgery. If it's between five and seven, uh, you won't get that on the USMLE because it's kind of a controversial gray area. So don't worry about that. Just know if it's less than five, we're going to have to do, uh, she's going to pass it on her own. Uh, we'll strain the urine. And if it's greater than seven, uh, then we're going to need some kind of lithotripsy or open surgery. And that is it.